Two knocks are better than one, I can tell you that. <laughs> That's what my buddy's for. Keep us straight. Let me just say, uh, the committee come to order. Uh, normally, when we talk about nuclear energy, we're talking about electricity generation. But today, we will be discussing the non-electric application of nuclear energy and the system's integration. It is the technology uh, set that will truly transform how we think about and use energy. And I want to thank our witnesses who will provide us with insights on how we can best deploy these technologies over the next decade. Earlier this year, we had a hearing that focused on the importance of maintaining our current nuclear fleet and developing advanced reactors. That hearing set the stage nicely for this one, as developing additional value streams for nuclear technologies will help their competitiveness in electricity markets. In addition, being pioneers in this endeavor will allow the U.S. a competitive edge in the international market. Reducing emissions in the industrial sector has been identified as a significant challenge that we must tackle in order to meet our climate goals. The U.S. has had success in lowering emissions in electricity and transportation sector due to advances spearheaded by the Department of Energy and Energy Efficiency, renewables, batteries, and electric vehicles. But as we have progressed in these sectors, emissions from the industrial sector have increased by about 69% since 1990. The industrial sector also represents a significant portion of global emissions, accounting for approximately 28% of total greenhouse gas emissions. As developing economies begin to shift to more energy-intensive industries, the U.S. must be on the cutting edge in developing the technologies required, on to, uh, required to decarbonize industry. This shift is an enormous opportunity to deploy new technologies domestically and abroad to promote job growth here in the U.S. as the demand for nuclear technologies that reduce emissions and deliver industrial products such as hydrogen, chemical feedstock, district, uh, district heating, water purification, and building materials increases. Last year, we authorized a nuclear in integrated energy systems research development, demonstration, and commercial application program as a part of the Energy Act of 2020. And we are fortunate to have Dr. Shannon Bragg Sitton, uh, who is leading the crucial endeavor with us today. The Department of Energy and Natural Laboratories, National Laboratories, are developing energy systems designed to be jointly operated with nuclear energy to reduce emissions in both the power and non-power sectors while maximizing energy production and efficiencies. In short, this program will help commercialize technologies to reduce emissions for water purification, heat for industrial processes, microgrids, district heating, and other various applications, all through the use of nuclear energy. The Department of Energy is leading a tri-lab consortium, including Idaho National Lab, the National Renewable Energy Lab, and Nettle in Morgantown, West Virginia, to pioneer the technologies to transform how we use energy. As we begin this transition, it is my hope that we can commercially deploy these types of technologies in my state of West Virginia. However, West Virginia has had a ban on the construction of nuclear power plants for over two decades. Uh, this is something that I would like to see changed. And I have spoken to all of my friends in the legislature, and I think they understand the, understand the need and the urgency also. I believe advanced nuclear reactors hold enormous potential to provide opportunity to communities across the country with zero emission base load power. I'm very excited to get the utility perspective today from Dr. Paul Chodak uh, on how we can best deploy the next generation of nuclear. With that, I'm going to turn to my friend, Ranking Member Barrasso, for his opening statement. Well, thanks so much, Mr. Chairman, for holding this very important hearing uh, today. Nuclear technology is fundamental to meeting America's energy, environmental, and our national security needs. Nuclear energy is necessary for reliable, affordable, and resilient electric service. Now more than ever, we need to be looking for opportunities to expand the use of nuclear energy. The U.S. currently has 93 operating commercial reactors in 28 states. Reactors provide 20 percent of our electricity. They provide the majority of our carbon-free energy. These reactors could safely remain online for decades. Yet many of our nuclear reactors are facing political and economic pressures to shut down. Since 2013, 12 reactors have shut down. This trend needs to stop. Earlier this year, this committee took an important step by advancing the nuclear credit program. That program will only provide a temporary fix. Reckless federal and state policies are pushing excess amounts of wind and solar energy onto the grid. 
The result is an oversupply of electric capacity that forces nuclear reactors off the grid. In some parts of the country, these policies have caused wholesale electricity prices to drop below zero. Nuclear operators have been left with no choice but to consider ways to reduce costs, to increase revenues, or to shut down. Today, we're discussing potential expanded revenue streams. Some nuclear operators are pursuing non-electric applications and other specialized uses. Several nuclear operators are making or considering investments in hydrogen and ammonia production. Others are looking at powering Bitcoin mining data centers. Nuclear operators are also considering the production of medical isotopes, elements used in the diagnosis and treatment of diseases like cancer. Each of these innovative applications presents an opportunity to retain our existing nuclear power plants. Innovation will be the key to reestablishing America's leadership in nuclear energy. Over the next decade, we expect advanced nuclear reactors to be in operation. Advanced reactors will be smaller, safer, and more efficient. They'll also generate less nuclear waste. Some may even run on previously used nuclear fuel. My home state of Wyoming will host Terra Power's Natrium Reactor, which will be the first of its kind anywhere in the world. It's designed to generate and store electricity. Like existing reactors, advanced nuclear technologies will enable new market opportunities beyond the electricity sector. Unlike existing reactors, which require modifications to enable these applications, advanced reactors are specifically designed for multiple purposes. The heat from advanced nuclear reactors can drive a variety of industrial processes. It can improve the efficiency of economics of chemical, hydrogen, and medical isotope production. Nuclear heat can contribute to enhanced oil recovery. This heat can also clean up wastewater and turn salt water from our oceans into fresh water. In addition, small advanced reactors are well suited for specialized electricity generation. The Department of Defense is considering transportable micro reactors for powering remote bases. These same reactors could also provide needed power for disaster recovery. Micro reactors will even power missions in space. We must ensure American technologies are leading this global expansion of nuclear energy. Today, we're going to hear about exciting new applications for nuclear energy. These new applications can help make nuclear energy profitable. It can also create new markets around the world for American-made nuclear technologies. So thanks so much, Mr. Chairman, for holding this important hearing. And I look forward to hearing from our panel of experts and look forward to the testimony. Thank you, Senator Barrasso. Now let me welcome our highly qualified panel of witnesses for their opening statements. And we're going to start with Dr. Shannon bragg -Sitton. Uh, she's the Division Director of the Integrated Energy and Storage System, Idaho National Lab. And thank you for being here. You want to turn your speaker on, if you will? Okay. Good morning. I want to thank Chairman Manchin and Ranking Member Barrasso for scheduling this important hearing and for the opportunity today to participate. As you said, my name is Shannon bragg -Sitton and I'm the Director of the Integrated Energy and Storage Systems Division at Idaho National Laboratory. INL is the nation's center for nuclear energy research and development, and INL works with industry to develop and deploy advanced reactors that will power American prosperity into the future. We also lead DOE's Light Water Reactor Sustainability Program, which is working to extend the operating lifetime of our high-performing nuclear fleet. And a key focus for both of these programs is extending the use of nuclear energy beyond electric generation. Integrated energy systems refer to power plants that are able to leverage multiple energy sources to meet a variety of energy demands, and these systems provide us with many benefits. They provide the ability to couple diverse energy sources, such as nuclear, renewable, and fossil with carbon capture, allowing us to leverage the benefits of each resource. This provides us with more efficient energy use, which helps the environment while keeping consumer costs down. And they also increase revenues for plant owners by providing multiple product streams, and they offer the potential for cleaner, lower cost, and more efficient transportation and industrial applications. These integrated systems will help us to stabilize the grid through their flexible operation. And it's exciting to begin examining their non-grid applications, which could include water desalination, production of clean hydrogen, production of heat and hydrogen to support industrial processes such as steel manufacturing or to produce synthetic fuels for transportation or ammonia-based fertilizers for the agricultural sector. And this isn't just theoretical. 
we are partnering with the private sector to demonstrate how existing nuclear plants can use their excess heat and electricity when it isn't needed by the grid in order to produce hydrogen. Today, hydrogen is primarily produced by breaking down methane, which also produces carbon dioxide. And if we instead use non-emitting nuclear energy to produce hydrogen from water, we can realize enormous emission savings across multiple industries. And these projects are an important part of DOE's Earthshot initiative, which aims to reduce the cost of clean hydrogen to decarbonize industrial applications, as well as to realize a net zero economy by 2050. So we are partnering with a tri-utility consortium that will first demonstrate clean hydrogen production using water electrolysis at the Energy Harbor Davis Bessie plant in Ohio. That will be followed by higher temperature steam electrolysis demonstrated at an Excel nuclear plant in Minnesota. And in the third phase, we'll demonstrate larger scale hydrogen production at the Palo Verde Generating Station in Arizona in partnership with Arizona Public Service. Additionally, INL, Argonne National Laboratory and the National Renewable Energy Laboratory are partnered with Exelon Generation, who is also demonstrating hydrogen production at their Nine Mile Point plant in New York. And these projects will produce hydrogen in the next year. These efforts will enhance grid stability and will create an additional revenue stream for these nuclear plants. This is becoming more important as the financial pressures on our existing fleet are increasing, as evidenced by recent plant closures. Because traditional nuclear plants operate 24-7, they are impacted by negative power prices, which occur when generation appears simultaneously with reduced electricity demand. And these situations are becoming more prevalent as we have more deployment of variable renewables. Hydrogen production will enable these plants to become more profitable as they continue to produce more than half of our nation's carbon-free electricity and contribute roughly $600 billion annually to our economy. Finally, I want to emphasize that integrated systems research is not just about the current fleet. Advanced reactors that are in development today and planned for deployment within the next decade are designed to operate at higher temperatures, to run more efficiently, and provide greater flexibility. And working in concert with renewables, these advanced reactors can power microgrids in isolated communities, supply heat and electricity to remote mining applications, produce synthetic fuels, and much more. These advanced reactors could even be sited at retiring coal plants to ensure reliable, affordable electricity remains available for these communities. All of this is vital to our nation's economy and environment as we develop technologies that will create clean energy jobs, reduce land use and the impact on air and water, promote energy independence, and increase our nation's economic competitiveness. So thank you again for the opportunity to testify here today, and I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you. Next, we're going to have Dr. Paul Chodak, uh, Executive Vice President, Generation of American Electric Power. You want to turn your speaker on? And just bring that up to you a little bit closer. It should be on. Just tap it. Let me see. Got it. Okay. Good morning, Chairman Manchin, Ranking Member Barrasso, and members of the committee. As Executive Vice President responsible for AEP's generation assets, I am privileged to be part of one of the nation's largest electricity producers with approximately 31,000 megawatts of diverse generation capacity, including more than 50. 5,900 megawatts of renewable energy and 2,100 megawatts of nuclear energy at our Cook Nuclear Plant in, on Lake Michigan. American Electric Power also plans to grow its renewable generation portfolio by approximately 16.6 .6 gigawatts, which will put our capacity at 50 percent renewables by 2030. With our aggressive plan to invest in renewable resources, AAP is on track to achieve an 80 percent reduction in carbon dioxide emissions from 2,000 levels by 2030 and is committed to achieve a net zero by 2050. However, the technology to ensure that we are able to reliably and cost-effectively achieve net zero is still in development. We need a diverse mix of solutions because the best solution will likely vary by region. Fossil generation with carbon capture may be the most effective solution where local geology supports CO2 storage while advanced nuclear generation sources can make the most sense in regions where the geology is not good for CO2 sequestration and long-distance pipelines are impractical. As a U.S. Navy nuclear submariner and later as a Los Alamos National Lab scientist 
work to prevent non-state actors from developing nuclear explosives, I had a clear mission of which I was very proud. Today, my mission is to provide our customers with safe, reliable, and when I say reliable, I mean 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, regardless of the weather, at as low a cost as possible. Our modern way of life depends on the successful execution of that mission. The United States operates the largest and highest performing fleet of nuclear reactors in the world. The fleet already safely provides over half the carbon fleet free electricity consumed in the United States. Small modular reactors, or SMRs, their designs go further by incorporating decades of operating experience and technology improvements to produce even safer and inherently safe reactor designs. Several advanced reactors are currently in the design and development phase and will complement renewables by generating carbon-free electricity. In addition, they are also capable of multiple non-electric functions, such as hydrogen production. Hydrogen can be used to store large quantities of energy and to enhance grid reliability as non, as, and as a non-emitting transportation fuel. This is similar to the DOE demonstration projects that, that Dr. Bragg Seiton talked about at Palo Verde and Nine Mile Power Plants. Desalination plants will need SMRs as the world continues to stretch the supply of fresh water. Advanced nuclear plants that operate at high temperatures can also help decarbonize the industrial sector by providing electricity and hydrogen and process heat. SMRs offer resilient, reliable, and long-term power to facilities important to national security like military bases. I would also add that in my personal experience at Los Alamos National Lab, I saw firsthand the importance of the U.S. actively developing and deploying civilian nuclear technology if it is to remain influential in the development of international nuclear policy. The first SMRs are expected to be commercially viable in the 2027 to 2029 timeframe. Continued engagement between the private sector and the federal government is needed to advance the technology and offset the financial risks of early adoption of this technology. SMRs are very large investments that are likely to have 40-year life cycles. Consequently, they require significant regulatory and legislative support. We believe SMRs can provide an essential component to renewable sources and can have a valuable tool to address carbon reductions and meet the growing energy needs of the U.S. economy. Finally, AAP is very focused on the development and support of the communities we serve. The highly skilled energy workforce in our Appalachian service territory have powered America's economy for decades. Through no fault of their own, these communities are now being negatively impacted by the country's need to move toward a low-carbon economy. Nuclear generation sources bring with them large numbers of good-paying jobs. Through the cogeneration of power and hydrogen, these communities can continue to meet the energy demand of our economy while making possible our nation's transition to net zero. Given the tremendous challenges ahead, we can ill afford to forego this great resource. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next, we have Dr. Michael Gostella, uh, Executive Director of the Council of Radionuclides and the Radio Pharmaceuticals. Doctor, thank you. Good morning, Chairman Manchin, Ranking Member Brasso, and members of the committee. I'm Michael Guastella, the Executive Director of the Council on Radionuclides and Radio Pharmaceuticals. CORAR is an association of companies that manufacture and distribute radioactive sources and medical isotopes in the United States. Thank you for the opportunity to provide the committee with our concerns with the current supply of isotopes. Medical isotopes are used by nuclear medicine doctors to diagnose or treat disease. Nuclear medicine has the distinct advantage of being non-invasive with few side effects. We estimate that there are 20 million nuclear medicine procedures performed annually for diseases such as cancer, heart disease, Parkinson's disease, and Alzheimer's disease. In the mid-1990s, the last U.S. commercially operated reactor that produced fission-based medical isotopes was closed and decommissioned. In addition, in the late 90s, the U.S. government closed the stable isotope production facility at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. These two actions left the medical and industrial communities more reliant on foreign sources. Few in the government focused on the loss 
of the domestic medical isotope production until 9-11, when many of the isotopes coming from abroad were temporarily cut off due to the cessation of flights into the U.S. In the years following 9-11, your committee took up the concern over the lack of a domestic supply of medical isotopes and to remove the use of highly enriched uranium in the production of medical isotopes led the effort to enact the Amer American Medical Isotope Production Act of 2012, AMIPA. AMIPA focused on the Department of Energy on assisting in the development of domestic medical isotope production from non-HEU sources. I'm proud to be here today to say thank you for this committee's acknowledgement of the isotope supply issues and your support in addressing our concerns. Also, I want to recognize past Chairman Bingaman and Ranking Member Murkowski for their leadership and efforts that resulted in the enactment of AMIPA. Now, let me update the committee on U.S. isotope supply, opportunities, and challenges. Of the 20 million nuclear medicine procedures performed annually in the U.S., an estimated 15 million of these procedures utilize a medical isotope that is used for diagnostic imaging procedures as and is predominantly, at approximately 90 percent, sourced from overseas. We note that U.S. patients rely on other medical isotopes that are either sole sourced or predominantly sourced from overseas. For example, palladium-103 is used to manufacture brachytherapy seeds, and the primary source of palladium-103 is Russia. These radioactive seeds are primarily used in early stage prostate cancer treatment. The DOE has also been a supportive and constructive partner through efforts of the Office of Science Isotope Program to domestically produce both the isotopes that are needed because commercial production has not yet been established or is not sufficient to meet U.S. medical and industrial needs. The DOE Isotope Program accomplishes this through a network of production sites that utilize national laboratory resources. DOE especially plays a critical role in producing and distributing isotopes needed in scientific research and for initial medical clinical development. And there are not scientific commercial incentives, as there are not, excuse me, sufficient commercial incentives for production of such isotopes. Coror and its member companies believe that where commercially feasible, medical and industrial isotopes should be produced by the private sector. Various companies are currently developing reactor and non-reactor capabilities to help scale up domestic production of essential medical isotopes. Cora believes that when diverse commercial production sources can meet U.S. demand, the DOE isotope program should exit the market for such isotopes, consistent with the mission of the DOE isotope program. Cora would recommend that the committee continue to support the DOE's research, development, and production activities, also, CORA suggests that the committee suggest an increase in DOE's industry and government cooperation through a stakeholder and an agency advisory committee to help define the nation's isotope needs and help identify opportunities to increase domestic isotope production. I thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and I welcome any questions that you might have. Thank all of you for doing a great job, and we appreciate it. So we'll start our questioning now, and I'm going to start with Dr. Shannon Bragg-Sitton. Um, U.S.-based companies are working with the national labs to bring advanced nuclear technology to market, technologies that can generate high temperatures needed for manufacturing. Uh, we know that the industrial sector is difficult to decarbonize because of the technological challenges and the volume of energy that must be replaced with non-emitting technologies. The manufacturing industry in the U.S., uses about 25 exajoules, did I say that correct, exajoules, of energy. About 20% of this is from electricity, 40% from steam, and 40% from fossil-fired combustion. And over 90% of the primary energy required is currently derived from the combustion of fossil fuels. So, can you explain the advantages of advanced nuclear plants for process heat applications or hydrogen production? And what I'm trying to look is the price model, too, there to make it more competitive price-wise. So using that, if we're going to be replacing our fossils, I want to make sure that we have the horsepower to do it. Thank you so much for that question. Senator Manchin, <clears throat> excuse me. 
Absolutely. Advanced reactors can provide us with high temperature heat to produce hydrogen very efficiently. Using that high temperature heat and electricity, we can produce hydrogen approximately 30 to 50 percent more efficiently than just using electricity alone. And we can provide that heat directly via steam or via in stored energy and energy storage systems to support that industrial application and bring those costs down such that we can bring back domestic manufacturing, steel manufacturing, all without carbon emissions associated with it. <coughs> Excuse me. And these industrial applications uh, can be very efficient, can be produced just as efficiently as with uh, fossil resources, but doing so without emissions provide us significant advantage over these competing technologies. Do you see it? I think that it looks like nuclear is the, if we're going to decarbonize the industrial sector, uh, I don't believe personally that we can do it with renewables. So we need to do it with something that has the horsepower and basically is dispatchable 24-7. Is nuclear the way to go? Yes, I believe it is. Dr. Shodak? Yes, yes, sir. Dr. Guest? You can just leave your mics on, everybody, okay. much easier. Okay, it's good to get that understanding. In light, and, and this is Dr. to Dr. Shodak on, this will be yours. In light of recent legislation developed in the emergence of U.S. companies building advanced reactors in the next decade, the, my legislature is working in West Virginia to reverse the civil uh, nuclear that restricts the construction of nuclear plants in the state. I think we're going to get that done. They understand. Several potential sites in West Virginia across the country have pre-existing infrastructure we have uh, coal-fired plants that are going down. I think my friend in uh, Wyoming has a coal-fired plant. Everything's there. The base is there to work off of. So would that be the way for us to go as we're de taking nuclear, I mean, taking fossil coal off, of, uh, off the grid, but having all the interchangeable, the switch stations right there on the site, would that be our best way to get up and running quicker? Yes, Senator. If you can hit the targets that they're talking about for SMRs, if they can build them for, you know, three thousand, two to three thousand dollars per kW, and if they can get a levelized cost that's competitive at around fifty dollars per megawatt hour, then nuclear technology makes a, a tremendous amount of sense. Uh, Doctor, let me see. I, I don't. You're saying it's five cents, five cents a kilowatt hour is what you're talking. Right. Okay. At five cents, I don't see that in my energy reports every day. I see it being up there high in the nine, ten, eleven, twelve, even higher. So the five cents is just the generation cost, and then on top of that, you've got the cost to actually transmit it to you. So the generation cost is probably around five cents. And what would that? Well, how does that compare with gas and uh, natural gas combined cycle and uh, coal? Three dollar natural gas would be close closer to three cents per three kilowatt cents, hour. Three cents, okay. And coal? And and coal is right around in there too. Natural gas and coal are probably around twenty and thirty dollars. So nuke, nuke is a little nuke is higher. Nuke is is a there any way that you can see through advanced technology and how we basically are using this money that we're talking about a good bit of money for research and development? Can we get that cost down, or does a new generation of nuclear will that bring it down? Senator, I believe I believe it will. Those are the targets they're talking about, and we're talking about ten years from now. So the cost of power ten years from now is likely going to be above that three cents per kilowatt hour. It's going to be closer to that four or five cents. I think at those prices, the nuclear can be competitive. The key is to get through the first-of-a-kind costs, and that's where we need a lot of collaboration in state and at federal level because there are additional costs associated with that. And so the programs that the DOE is engaging in to do the R&D is very, very helpful in that regard. But also remember that these are 40-year cycles. As a, as a utility, my job is to be cost effective for my customers. That's the number one thing after. Well, I want to take the liberty of asking one more question, if you don't mind. No, the liberty of asking one more question is this. We had a program that was presented to us called CEPP, which we were going to pay utilities to end the carbon, uh, the fossil cycle, if you will. And it was basically geared towards coal. And I understand coal has gone from 52 percent of, of basically producing the power for our country down to 19 percent. People don't realize we're going in the right direction if that's what they want. But the bottom line is we had gas fill the back, come back and fill uh, the base load. So we had base load power. Going down that cycle, do we have anything that we replace the dispatchable base load power by 2030 if we took all of our fossil off? Can any of you answer? Because I just go down. Do you think we'd have been in jeopardy of not having dispatchable power base load? 
Absolutely. We need to have that dispatchability, that nuclear energy. But the way they were, this program was going, your thought, did you know a little bit about the CEPP? No, I did not. Okay, well, you ought to read up on it. So, so I'm, I'm familiar, Senator, I'm familiar with the CEPP, and, and, and you're absolutely right. If, if you were to remove baseload generation dispatchable power from the grid by 2030, then you couldn't guarantee the reliability and stability. So of the reliability, and, and, and reliability, first of all, and the cost would have been outrageous, too, I'm understanding. Exactly. Okay. Doctor? Senator Manchin, I'm not an expert in power, so... Okay. I <laughs> <laughs> well, then I'm going to let you pass on that one. <laughs> Senator Brasso. Well, let me testify that Senator Manchin is an expert in power and how to use it. Well, he certainly, he, cer <laughs> <laughs> he, he certainly sounds like he is. Thank you, Senator. <laughs> oh, boy. Dr. Kodak, uh, Terra Power has announced plans to build its uh, natrium advanced nuclear reactor in my home state of Wyoming. Uh, this reactor will be the first of its kind built uh, anywhere in the world. Uh, it will also be the first time a nuclear reactor uses the infrastructure and workforce from a retired coal plant. Uh, why are utilities interested in advanced nuclear technologies like Terra Power's natrium reactor? Senator, they're, they're interested because it, it complements renewables very well um, and supplies the dispatchable resources. You know, when we talk about 24, 365, Regardless of the weather, we saw what happened in Texas with URI. We saw the devastation that that caused. We saw the challenges that you see in California today where their California Public Utility Commission just went out and said, hey, we need gas resources. We need dispatchable power to make sure the lights don't go out. There are still days in a row where you don't have the wind blowing and, and it's very cloudy. And so you have to have that dispatchable resource. And small modular reactors are flexible. They can load ramp. They are small in size, so they take much smaller footprint. I believe the Natrium reactor takes about a 44-acre footprint, very small footprint. Um, and because it has the molten salt energy storage device in it, it can ramp up from 345 to 500 megawatts. That's considerable ramp up during the time when solar energy is dropping off at the end of the day. Everybody's coming home, turning on their, their computers, turning on their lights, turning on their stoves, and that's exactly when solar power is going away. That's when that Natrium reactor can respond. And small modular reactors are flexible and designed to be able to do that. Okay. Um, Mr. Costello, the uh, particle accelerators, nuclear reactors, are used to produce medical isotopes. Um, the elements which doctors use diagnose treat cancers, number of diseases. Uh, research reactors and particle accelerators provide the bulk of these isotopes. What kind of opportunities do existing chemical reactors present for medical isotope production? And then also, what kind of opportunities do advanced reactors like Terra Power? Uh, present for medical isotope production, so both the advanced and the and the traditional. Uh, well, Senator, thank you, thank you for that question. Uh, I, I'm not a nuclear engineer, so what I'd like to do is uh, uh, submit that question for a uh, uh, a question for the record, so that uh, we can respond with uh, uh, more detail. Um, to your point, um, uh, research reactors. Particle accelerators uh, are being used currently. Uh, there's a lot of research uh, and development being done right now, particularly with particle accelerators in the U.S. Uh, uh, commercially. Uh, and uh, I think it'd be uh, uh, a, a good thing to actually uh, take that question offline and then provide some additional information to the committee. Thank so, you. So could you explain why it is important for the United States to maintain and enhance our ability to produce medical and industrial isotopes? Uh, well, we are dependent, like I mentioned in my opening comments, uh, we're significantly dependent on uh, foreign sourced uh, materials. Um, that includes molybdenum. Um, that's the, uh, 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 the daughter isotope of molybdenum is technesium. Uh, and uh, about 75% uh, of all nuclear medicine procedures require technesium. Um, and uh, what we've seen in the past is when we have issues um, like the uh, pandemic, the start of the pandemic, when commercial flights were canceled from uh, Europe, uh, we had a significant issue with, uh, with access here in the U.S. And, and accessing those products. So increasing domestic production is incredibly important to ensure accessibility um, to, uh, to needed isotopes, and there, there are many others, not only radioactive, but stable isotopes also. Great. Um, Dr. Kodak, one more for you. The world is looking to expand the use of nuclear energy to meet its environmental and energy goals. U.S. leadership in the nuclear energy sector, I believe, is critically important. 
To what extent can utilization of nuclear reactors for non-electric applications like hydrogen production further enhance our leadership in terms of energy and around the world? Well, Senator, as, as I alluded to in my testimony, I've got firsthand experience with being at the negotiating table with international nuclear authorities. <clears throat> and the question that was leveled at us, no matter what we said, was, well, you guys aren't deploying anything. You haven't built anything in 30 years. Why should we listen to you? In essence, that was their argument, which is a very difficult to argue ar argument, very difficult to argue with that. If we're out there deploying leading the way in technology and, and defining systems, and out there showing how it can be done, how nuclear technology can be used for all these non-electric sources, then we're able to have a seat at the table and have a conversation and credibly argue for the international policy that we believe to be correct. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. Now we're going to go to Senator Cortez Masto. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you. This is an incredibly important panel, so appreciate you all being here. Let me follow up on Senator Barrasso's um, question, um, Dr. Costello, to you. With respect to the production of medical isotopes, um, I am interested in how um, we can utilize the current nuclear reactors for the production of it versus uh, the advanced technology that we're looking at, which one is better. So whatever research you put together and you submit, would you please submit it to my office as well? Absolutely. Thank you, because I think this is an important issue. Are you familiar with the GE-180 tracer? I am not, no. Okay, so the GE-180 tracer um, was uh, approved by the FDA to um, help really understand the underlying causes of Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. And it happened in Las Vegas at the Lou Ruva Clinic, mm -hmm. Cleveland Clinic, by one of our doctors. And this is a perfect example of supporting what you're saying, right. why this production, medical isotopes, are so important. But in layman's terms, can you explain? When people hear medical isotopes, that's very confusing, uh, I, I think. And, and it doesn't explain how this is utilized to help uncover the causes and determine really what we're trying to understand with Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, and so many others. Can you explain it in layman's terms how it's utilized? Um, sure. Let's, let's take a, a simple example um, using PET imaging. So the uh, GE machine that you mentioned, uh, I'm sure, is a machine that is used to produce uh, PET isotopes. Um, so um, We'll take PET imaging and a, a fairly um, generic use of that technology in uh, the diagnosis of cancer. So um, a fluorine-18 radio, uh, radioisotope is attached to a sugar molecule, glu glucose, uh, and that's injected into a, a, a patient. And um, glucose is used by every cell in the body. Mm -hmm. um, but cells that are... Um, particularly active, um, that have a much higher level of metabolism, um, absorb more of that. And so with PET imaging using fluorinated glucose, FDG, um, physicians can actually diagnose where uh, cancer has metastasized. Um, that same technology can be used with a, a patient that has been uh, uh, diagnosed with cancer and then um, used after treatment to determine if some of those uh, tumors have actually uh, uh, decreased in size or actually um, gone away. Um, so it's a, it's a nice uh, example of how uh, nuclear medicine and PET imaging can be used, not only in diagnosis, but in forming treatment. Thank you so much. And, and then you, you ended your testimony talking about the need for stakeholder agency advisory committee can you talk a little bit, what, what, your vision for that? What, what do you anticipate? If we were to put something together like that, what, what would be its duties and functions? What, what, are, you, what are you thinking? Um, the isotope program had um, basically uh, through uh, the, uh, the NSAC um, um, uh, underwent a, uh, uh, an, uh, uh, an overview, uh, a review of isotope needs. Um, it was the uh, NSAC-I uh, isotope subcommittee that uh, has done that twice. The last report was in 2015. We think as, a, as an industry association it would be helpful to actually provide an, uh, another report uh, working with stakeholders, industry, researchers, clinicians, the, the isotope program, DOE, um, to evaluate uh, current needs, potential opportunities moving forward. 
and the, and the resources needed to accomplish the, uh, uh, the goals of the, uh, the action items that come out of that, uh, come out of that uh, committee. Thank you. And then uh, Dr. Chodok, um, let me ask you this. When it comes to all things nuclear, can you expand on the need for state and local input? Do you think it's important to have state and local input uh, as we look and move forward on all of these areas? As, uh, yes, as a utility, it? it's absolutely essential that we not only serve customers with safe, reliable power, but we serve them in the way that they want to be served. And we need to work very collaboratively with state and local governments to ensure that, that everybody's on board with the way that we serve. There are multiple options in, to serve customers, and, and generally speaking, we, we try to remain techno technologically agnostic. In other words, we're looking for the solution that, that provides that reliable, low-cost power, but also one that, that communities are willing and, and interested in having as part of, their, part of their mix. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. Senator Cassidy. Um, Dr. Bragg Sitton. Hello. Um, one of the things we hear and read about for small or micronuclear reactors is to help isolated communities after natural disaster. Louisiana was hit recently by Ida. And so, one, that was a lot of transmission line activities that were down. But um, one of the ways that they brought electricity back more quickly is fired back up a mothballed natural gas plant in New Orleans to allow at least a local sort of distribution. Uh, similarly, after Hurricane Delta and Laura uh, and Jeff Davis Parish, there was the, the local generating capacity was destroyed. So to what degree could uh, a, a, a small or micronuclear reactor help this? Obviously, I'm begging the answer. It could help a lot. So what I'm really asking is, what is the likelihood of this happening safely and on what time frame? Thank you for that question, Senator Cassidy. Uh, we have a number of companies that are interested in the development of micro-reactors for, for many applications, whether those be for deployment for permanent installations, remote communities, or for emergency deployment. Micro-reactors offer us the opportunity to have high-density energy in a very small package. Many of these micro-reactors are characterized by factory manufacturing, factory assembly, and rapid shipment to site for operation within just a few days. And there are a number of companies working on these to ensure that they will be available this decade, uh, as well as programs under the Department of Energy and the Department of Defense that are enabling rapid development. So what, would of be these. The ex what would be the cost of such? One, how long could it be used for? And what would be the cost per megawatt hour? And how does that relate to conventional or traditional forms of energy? With regard to operational time, many of these reactor technologies are designed to operate with extremely long fuel cycles, where our traditional plants today require refueling every 18 to 24 months. These micro reactors are designed to offer long life cycles of five years, 10 years, or even 20 years of operation so that they could be set down on site and operated for those long periods of time. With regard to costs, uh, we believe that they will be quite competitive with other energy sources that could be deployed in those types of regions. Okay. Uh, but for the record, I'd like to provide a detailed answer after communicating with some of those companies to understand their current cost numbers. So the way you answered that suggests to me that it might be more expensive, but if you're in a region where electricity is already more expensive, it would be competitive. But if you're in a place where electricity tends to be less expensive, it might be a little bit more highly priced. Yes, that's correct, in that if we were looking at a remote region that's currently dependent on diesel generators, this would be much more cost uh, effective than those diesel generators. But if we're looking to deploy something in a region that has large centralized power plants today, it might be a bit more expensive. So they won't be applicable uh, to all applications, but in many applications they will be a ready source of reliable deploy uh, dispatchable energy to meet those needs in emergency situations or to provide that long duration sustainable power to remote communities or remote industrial facilities. And what is the capacity? How, how much energy could they, well, do you imagine that they could produce for this long life cycle? So these micro reactors that could be packaged in these small transportable units are on the order of megawatts. So a few megawatts of electricity up to 10 or maybe 20 megawatts of electricity. 
really bound by the requirements of that factory manufacturing and easy shipment to site via truck, rail, barge, uh, types of technologies. Or so I have a lot of petrochemical industry, and obviously there's also been interest among the steel and cement and other energy-intensive industries to lower their carbon intensity. Mm -hmm. Now, this sounds like a way that they could have an on-site means by which they could, for that portion of their consumption that is related to uh, firing a boiler, mm -hmm. um, they could help decarbonize, correct? Yes, these types of technologies are something that could provide both the electricity to drive those processes, but also the heat of, that's necessary to drive the processes. And they can be sited very close to those applications uh, and, and be dispatchable uh, when that energy is needed for a very long duration of time, as I mentioned. Now, in life cycle, you talked about expense, but obviously there would, you would be avoiding the, if you're speaking about that long of a life cycle, you'd be avoiding all the input costs for whatever your traditional form of energy would be as well as theoretically your repair costs for lines if there were a, um, you know, if, if there's an IDA and it blows down your trans transmission lines, there's a cost of repair. Uh, under this circumstance, co-located, you would, one, be potentially more secure, but also avoid that kind of life cycle expense of maintaining a grid. Am I begging an answer again, or do you think that's reasonable? I think that is reasonable that these types of systems can support regional microgrids for both heat and electricity and therefore be much more secure under a variety of events, whether those be weather-related or otherwise, and, and provide that reliable energy for those long duration. And those long life cycles, those refueling cycles that are much longer, mean that we have much fewer operations required on site. And in fact, after that 10 or 20 year life cycle for that plant, we would then simply replace the core and refurbish that back at a factory. Got it. Thank you very much. I yield. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to go just a quick second round if anybody else wants to. I only have one question to any of you or all of you or whoever we want to answer. My state produces, my state uh, energy production is about 96 percent coal for my electricity needs in my state. So, and we export quite a bit of power from our state. Do you believe the state of West Virginia, the best direction for it to go would be as we transition to nuclear? Does it make sense because of the footprint that we already have, the substations we already have, everything connection, doesn't need any new transmission, doesn't need anything except a new plug-in model? You can start right here. We'll get down. Great. Thank you so much for that question. As Dr. Kodak mentioned, those, those coal sites offer us with significant infrastructure that these nuclear plants can come in and thereby reduce the cost of installing these plants to those uh, low numbers to make those very competitive. We can take advantage of the grid interconnection, and many studies are being conducted to better understand how much of the other assets in that region can be leveraged. Now, another opportunity that those sites offer us is that we now have a carbon-based feedstock that isn't going to production of electricity, but we could instead use that high-quality heat and electricity from a nuclear plant that goes into that site to process that carbon-based feedstock into higher value consumer products, thereby enhancing the economic development of those communities that are being impacted by this energy transition. So I think there's a really tremendous opportunity here. We're going to have to bring you to West Virginia, do a little, a little uh, fab, confab there and get everybody on the right track. <laughs> uh, Dr. Shodak. Senator Manchin, I'll just add, first off, I agree with everything that was just said, and I would just, I would just add that um, if you look at it today, CCS, you know, uh, fossil generation with carbon capture storage, and nuclear are the only two emission-free dispatchable sources that we really have that, that can go multi-days or even seasonal. Um, and when you look at West Virginia, West Virginia's geology is wonderful to look at, but in terms of storing CO2, not so good. Right. And so it's an outstanding opportunity for a small modular reactor to come in there. The key is we need to be able to get the cost down and be able to take down the risk of that first of a kind uh, through energy policy. Uh, when you layer in the secondary sources, you know, we have a, a, a chemical industry there in West Virginia along the river uh, where this, the process heat, the, the eight hydrogen production, and hydrogen production potential for export to the rest of the country, yeah. you're now looking at West Virginia doing what it used to do with coal, only now it's doing it with nuclear. Good. Well, I would I, defer, I know you're not an energy person. I, I, I would already heard it. 
about I would defer to the, the, the experts here on the panel, and if it actually increased medical isotope production domestically, it'd be a win across the board here, so. Thank you. I'm going to have to run, but Senator Brass is going to take over. And then we'll, okay. thank you. Thank you so much. I will do that. Uh, Dr. Bradson, uh, what, what more can be done to support private sector efforts to use nuclear energy for non-electric application? There are a number of efforts that are underway that are helping significantly to demonstrate these advanced reactor technologies. For example, the Advanced Reactor Demonstration Program is supporting those first demonstrations of private sector uh, concepts, the, the natrium uh, reactor by TerraPower has been mentioned that uh, is planned for deployment in Wyoming, and the X Energy XE100 reactor will uh, be initially demonstrated in the state of Washington. Uh, this is, these demonstration projects get us a good considerable, uh, down, considerably down the path toward commercial deployment, but we do need those commitments to be sustained, not just demonstration, but deployment. Commercial scale deployment of these technologies needs continuing support. We need to look at policies that help to promote that. We need to understand how these technologies not only provide us with reliable heat and electricity, uh, but also that reduced carbon emission that is so important to achieving that net zero economy. And the pathway to decarbonizing uh, industry is, is very challenging. There's not very many technologies that can. So I would say continued support to ensure that we get to large scale commercial deployment of these technologies that will help us toward that net zero future is essential. So, so when we get to this point of the deployments and the scope in this uh, that you're talking about and mm -hmm. that I'm looking forward to in the long term future, so these reactors are going to be smaller, safer, more efficient. What kind of opportunities do these specific characteristics, something that's smaller, safer, more efficient, present for the siting and for the economic viability of, of nuclear energy? The smaller packages offer us uh, the opportunity to locate these plants, these reactors, much closer to their end use. So that transport of heat is, is much shorter, much reduced heat loss. The smaller packaging also opens that opportunity for factory manufacturing that I mentioned with micro-reactors. The same thing applies to small modular reactors where we can begin to produce these in large numbers in a, a factory assembly line type of process to, such that they, don't, they no longer become an on-site, one-of-a-kind application, but we can reduce costs dramatically through that type of manufacturing approach which then when we get to those nth of a kind systems, then our costs come down significantly overall. Uh, Mr. Costello, you know, can you talk a little bit about targeted alpha therapy? That uh, seems to be a promising option for cancers that aren't any longer responsive to some conventional treatments. And could you just describe this treatment and how nuclear energy can enable the production of a new class of isotopes to help in our fight against cancer? Sure. Actinium... Uh 225 is a alpha emitter. Uh, it's uh, unfortunately in short supply right now, and uh, uh, anything that we can do to increase the production of uh, actinium-225 would be uh, helpful. Um, there's a lot of work being done right now in uh, using uh, alpha emitters like actinium-225 uh, in the uh, treatment of uh, uh, cancer. Uh, so, for example, um, in prostate patients, um, the, uh, uh, a high percentage of prostate patients uh, express a protein, prostate-specific membrane antigen, uh, and the use of uh, an alpha emitter like actinium-225 to a, uh, a carrier, a protein, or a monoclonal antibody that would be specific to that antigen would now provide a very targeted uh, therapeutic uh, for, again, uh, patients that uh, express that particular antigen. And that really is kind of the definition of precision medicine. Um, and uh, what's also helpful is that the, the carrier protein, monoclonal antibody or whatever, can also be used with a diagnostic isotope. So you can identify the, uh, the appropriate patients and then use a, uh, a radiotherapy uh, like actinium, um, to uh, treat the patient. Great. Senator Cortez-Masto. Um, let, let me talk a little bit about another opportunity here, and I'm curious if it does exist, uh, around water purification. Mm. 
obviously Western states, I'm one of them, Senator Barrasso, uh, we all have concerns about a drought happening right now in the West and how we augment some of our water, particularly along the Colorado River. I know that in, in the past there's been uh, projects trying to couple the desalination with uh, existing nuclear power plants. Unfortunately, the cost is very high. Um, so I, I'm curious, both Dr. Bragsit and, and, and Dr. Chodak, if the advanced nuclear technology is going to be able to couple with this type of water purification and bring those costs down, or just your thoughts in general about the state of desalination, and is it in, in our purview, is it in 10, 20 years, is it something that's viable, but also economically viable as well? Thank you so much for that question. Uh, Idaho National Laboratory partnered with Arizona Public Service a few years ago to look at that exact question. How can we utilize excess energy from the Palo Verde Generating Station to desalinate water? It's a very interesting scenario there in that they have an ample amount of brackish groundwater uh, rather than seawater. And so looking at that resource and looking at reverse osmosis technology, which is commercially available at large scale, we actually found that there were uh, reasonable opportunities to bring those costs down and make that affordable to provide cooling water for that plant, which currently uses uh, municipal wastewater for cooling, uh, or to provide that to the agricultural regions or potable water for those growing communities uh, west of Phoenix. So there are some opportunities available, and it does depend on the water source. It depends on the economic uh, competitiveness of how else that electricity would be used. And in that case, it was curtail electricity uh, due to rising solar uh, penetration in that region or use it to produce this clean water. So there may be some viable options with technology we have today. And we see many uh, countries in the Middle East, for example, that are looking to enhance uh, water processing desalination to support their communities as well. Uh, reverse osmosis is driven purely by electricity to drive that process. Uh, there are also thermally driven desalination processes that may become more affordable as we begin looking to the higher temperature applications that are available with advanced reactors. So I do think there's a considerable pathway toward that. And another uh, item to consider is that these advanced reactors, in many cases, don't use water themselves for cooling. They use advanced cycles. So they can provide a positive output of water without using cooling water to operate. Thank you. Dr. Chodak, anything to add to that? So I would just add a little bit to, to, to that. That was a great answer. Uh, just, just a little bit to add to that would be small modular. Because it's modular, it can be built in a factory, so it's a lower cost. So when you think about a small modular reactor, the targets they're talking about, the numbers they're talking about, about two to $3,000 a kW. Compare that to existing you know, AP1000 designs, which are, you know, six to $12,000 per kW, so significantly less capital costs. And then the, the smaller means they can be sited closer to where that water is going to be used because they have a much smaller footprint. And because you're designing it up front, you can design that cycle and optimize it for that specific use. So there, there's, there's potential, there are multiple layers of potential cost savings and additional utility that you can get out of these designs. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Senator Murkowski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks for the hearing today. Um, one of the things that I miss about not being chairman of the committee <laughs> is, you know, before you'd get to sit and you'd listen to all this great stuff, and now I'm like everybody else. I come airdropping in right at the end when everyone's trying to wrap up. I get the gavel again. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so thank you for that, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> But these are, these are issues when it, when it comes to, uh, to nuclear, um, particularly the advances that we're seeing, um, advanced nuclear reactors, small modular. We just got uh, <clears throat> an announcement a couple weeks ago now that uh, at Eielson Air Force Base, the Department of Defense will be hosting the first pilot uh, of a micro reactor there. Wow. Um, Really excited to see the application there uh, and what it can mean for us in, in remote areas, uh, not only on military installations, but greater um, application elsewhere. So um, love the topic. So I, uh, I, I mentioned my excitement, but one of the things that um, I had been focused on certainly in, uh, in years previous to this is 
as we think about these advanced reactors, we need advanced fuel. And so we talk about HALU, high assay, low enriched uranium, of the 10 reactor designs selected for the advanced reactor demonstration program, nine use HALO. So I've, I've tried to focus on this as a, as a uh, supply chain issue and, and raising, the, uh, raising the concern. My understanding is that uh, today HALU is only commercially available from Russia. So I'd like to have a little bit of a discussion here this morning since everybody else is gone and I've got the gavel here. Um, what do we do? Do you all agree that we need to develop domestic supply here to produce HALO? I, I, I would hope that we think that that's preferable to reliance on foreign uh, sources. And if so, really what's our biggest obstacle here? Um, is this primarily an economic uh, and market issue? Is it a public policy problem? Um, what, it, what do you think we can do to build up um, this as, as the, the fuel source, if you will, and, and what more we might want to do on the infrastructure side? So let's start with you, uh, Dr. Bragg Stilton. Thank you, Senator Murkowski. Uh, you, you've you kind of hit the nail on the head on one of our challenges to these advanced reactors. With regard to high assay, low enriched uranium, we have different pathways to get there. We know how to do it. This is something that we can do at our national laboratories and work with, working with our fuel fabricators here in the United States. And it is essential that we have a domestic supply of this resource. And it provides us the opportunity to build these advanced reactors that can be put in smaller packages and operate more efficiently. So what do we need to do to make sure that we have that resource available? We need to make sure we put the investment in to establish that supply chain. Why haven't we done that before? Well, the demand wasn't necessarily there from the commercial sector previously. And now that we see this very large interest growing in the private sector to develop and deploy these technologies, now we're beginning to have that demand for this resource, for HALU, and we need to put the investment in to develop the capability to fabricate those So it's really uh, just been a chicken and an egg type of a thing, you know. Um, in my opinion, yes, frankly, that is a part of it, is until the demand's there, the supply chain won't be there. Yeah. We know how to do it. We know how to get there. But we need to invest in it to make sure that we can have that resource available. Okay. Others to this point? Uh, I, I, would, I would just add that, just to concur, that this is not amazing new technology. We, we absolutely know how to do this. It's just the, the market isn't there, and so the supply isn't there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, last year um, we established a program within DOE to support the domestic availability of HALU. Can anyone give me an update on the, on the current status of that program? Has the department been active in standing it up and, and getting it going? Yes, the, the program has stood up. That's actually led out of my laboratory by a okay. colleague of mine, and that has been moving forward. But again, we, we need to have that continued investment to, to move those processes forward, whether that is producing HALU from existing materials or enriching materials uh, down the line. But yes, things are moving forward, but we need more investment. Okay. One last question, and, and we're certainly hearing this in Alaska. I mentioned the uh, the, uh, the, the micro reactor that will be um, uh, deployed up in the interior part of the state. But I think educating and informing public about the reality of modern advanced nuclear system still remains a challenge. I think for so many, um, particularly in a state like Alaska where we, where we just don't have any nuclear power to speak of, so many still envision Three Mile Island, they think of Chernobyl when they think of, of nuclear, even though the small modular and the micro reactors are really a world apart in terms of, of safe operations. So uh, I know that you all are focused on, <coughs> on the, the technology, the research, the deployment, but I think we also recognize that um, 
we've got to do more when it comes to educating people that this nuclear is not just about clean energy, but it's also safe technology. How do we, how do we make this, this transition? We're doing it on the technology side, we're transitioning, but are we doing it in, in kind of the, in the, in the public mindset and what more can we be doing there? Well, and I throw that out to any of you. If, if I could just chime in, I can give you a good example. At our Cook Nuclear Plant on Lake Michigan, the community there is the strongest supporters of the Cook plant possible. And that occurs because the management of that plant invites people in uh, to come into the plant, to tour the plant, to see what's there and explain the technology. We have a visitor center that has models where we go in and, and we, we bring in school kids and we explain to them, here's how the plant works. And when people understand what something is, then they're no longer afraid of it. And when we start talking about these advanced designs that, particularly the inherently safe designs, where you can walk away from the facility at 100% power and physics and the nature, of, because it's a smaller size and a higher power to surface area ratio, the thing just naturally cools down and shuts itself down. And, and when you start explaining those things to people and they get that understanding, then I think the fear level drops. Now, that, that's no small feat to help them understand it. And, and you do it almost one community at a time. But I, I think certainly the story is an excellent one. And it's just a matter of, uh, to your point, it's just a matter of education. We do have to get the word out. And, and Senator Mikowski, I, I would say from a medical isotope perspective, uh, it's very similar. It's not community now, it's patient by patient. Um, so uh, there is trepidation by patients when they walk into a nuclear medicine department. Uh, you know, they see a radiation sign and, and um, you know, they, they, some will freak out. But educating, um, educating patients that we're talking about a very low level of activity, they're very short-lived, the half-lives of the isotopes that we use in, in healthcare are, are very short. Um, they're excreted from the body uh, efficiently. And again, patient by patient, and with uh, some of the uh, educational efforts uh, that are being done, not only by industry, but by the uh, Society of Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Imaging, uh, I think we're making some efforts. And with some of the new uh, therapies, for example, uh, Senator Barrasso uh, asked about these a little bit er earlier, the uh, 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 targeted alpha therapies, for example, that use uh, isotopes like actinium. Uh, uh, we continue to make inroads, uh, especially when they are so efficacious and help patients. Good. Well, thank you. Well, and as I have indicated my interest, voila, everybody else shows up. Here we so are. I'm going to turn the gavel back. Everybody to wants to be where you are. The cool yeah. people yeah. are here, yeah. <laughs> look at the senior senator from this, Idaho, Senator this, Risch. This is it. This is it. Look who, look, and who's... <laughs> Four uh, Republicans, well, no Democrats. It's uh... <laughs> well, could it be a better day? <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, well, and well, the first, and the, the first witness, yep. magnificent yep. Uh, from the Idaho National That's Lab. That's great. Uh, thank we you. toured together. Yeah, thanks so much. As well as Senator Murkowski. Yeah. That that wasn't your first trip to the lab, was no, it? It's not that, be my last yeah, trip. that's good. Well, thank you, uh, and, and thank you, uh, Senator Brasso, and to uh, the chairman for holding this hearing. Uh, th this is something I think that uh, most people aren't uh, aware of. Uh, if they are aware of the, the importance of nuclear energy, uh, most people don't drill down this far, so it's important that, that we do explore these th kinds of things. I'm proud to represent the nation's flagship nuclear energy laboratory, the Idaho National Lab, uh, which uh, we still have the first three light bulbs there that were lit by uh, nuclear energy. So uh, we're very, very proud of that. We built 52, 53 reactors over time since then, um, some demonstration, some, uh, some actually working. Um, but uh, Senator Murkowski, you, you'll be glad to hear you were, you were talking about the... Uh, about uh, Alaska and not, and not uh, having access to nuclear power at the lab right now, they're building the, the SMR, the small modular reactor generations, which will serve a smaller community. But you'll be uh, interested to hear that uh, they're also on the drawing boards for the micro reactor that, uh, which which a lot of us have been pushing for a long time. Look, if you can if you can, if you can put it on a ship and drive a ship with it, why can't you put it on a trailer and take it to deepest darkest? Uh, places of the world, you know, so. Anyway, uh, I think that's, that, that, that is certainly uh, the future, uh, whether people want to or not. Obviously, we're gonna run out of uh, uh, these fossil fuels and probably stop using them even before we run out of them, but this is, this is the only way to deliver a, a load and uh, uh, 
uh, certainly uh, the, the Idaho National Laboratory is uh, is on the front edge of that. There's there's no uh, question about that. Uh, from the safety standpoint, that was was just being discussed. I think most people, again, when you talk about uh, if they throw Three Mile Island in your face or Chernobyl, uh, you can always come back with it. Look, the the entire Navy is run on, on uh, nuclear uh, reactors. Uh, they're all over the world now. We've only got 93 in the United States, but they're 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 growing dramatically all over the world, and it's it's the safest uh, it's it's one of the safest uh, things to do in the world. Uh, we we just don't have those kind of things anymore. We have better engineering and everything else. So, so it's important, I think, that all of us be advocates for uh, for how safe not not only how clean nuclear energy is, but uh, but how safe it is. So. Um, the, the the area that we're talking about today, I think, is particularly important, uh, and uh, and I think uh, uh, that uh, Shannon, it's good to have you here. You're recognized world worldwide as a pioneer in this field of non-electric uh, applications for nuclear energy, and I think it's it's particularly important that we be focusing on this now as our nuclear fleet. Uh, continues to shrink. Uh, originally, it was just from uh, wearing out or, or time. Now, uh, economics is playing a lot more, uh, a lot bigger role in that, particularly when you have other forms of, of energy being used altern uh, alternately uh, to, to uh, make, uh, to substitute for the nuclear uh, power that's generated. So I'd, I'd like each of you, if you would, for a minute to talk about the urgency of finding these additional uh, economic streams uh, that, as to how that will help maintain the fleet that we have. Shannon, why don't you go first, since you're from Idaho. <laughs> Thank you, Senator Risch. Uh, it, it's essential that we act quickly. These, the existing fleet of nuclear plants, as you mentioned, is, having, is experiencing financial pressures as we see more and more variable renewable resources coming online. That variability requires our uh, baseload or traditionally baseload generation to respond to that uh, and to dial back power. That, that's not necessarily the best economic uh, performance. These plants can do it. They can technically uh, provide that flexible response. But if we don't operate these to the fullest extent possible, we're essentially throwing away some of that resource and throwing away what we could be utilizing. If we only look first at decarbonizing the electric sector, I think we're going to miss a really elegant solution to use these powerhouses of clean heat and electricity to support broader decarbonization. A, a nuclear plant is a producer of heat, which we then convert to electricity. So using that heat directly to support these areas that are very difficult to decarbonize and, and probably shouldn't always be electrified or can't be electrified then we can be, become, we can then come to a solution that still meets that reliable, resilient grid and meets that demand at all times, working right alongside other clean energy generators like renewables, like fossil with carbon capture, but then using the excess heat and electricity to get to those hard to abate sectors. And we can get to those net zero goals much more rapidly if we looked at these holistic solution sets. Appreciate that. I, and, I, Senator, not only do we get to those goals much more rapidly, <clears throat> but we get there much more cost effectively. Um, if you look at the existing fleet today, part of the reason they are economically challenged is because the playing field is not at all level. They're bringing value to the grid in terms of dispatchable capacity that's available, and there's no real market mechanism that compensates them appropriately for that. Mm -hmm. And then they're thrown into an energy market where they're competing against renewable resources that have investment tax credits and production tax credits, which can drive down the price for power to actually negative numbers so that you have to pay to keep your unit online to deliver power. That, that's, that's an unreasonable situation, particularly since these assets are so incredibly valuable for us meeting our decarbonization goals. So I think one of the things we can do for the existing fleet is to put them on a level thing field and give them a production tax credit and make those tax incentives such that they can actually use them by using direct pay uh, mechanisms to, to provide that support and level the playing field so those units can compete. Level playing field is incredibly important. Uh, Senator Risch, from a, from a medical isotope perspective, uh, in, in the U.S., uh, all the medical isotopes 
that are produced domestically are done either through research reactors like uh, the uh, Missouri, uh, uh, the University of Missouri Research Reactor, as an example, uh, or, or particle accelerators. Uh, power reactors in Canada, for example, uh, are being used for uh, a certain amount of uh, isotope production. And I would defer to the, uh, to the experts whether uh, the nuclear power fleet, fleet here in the U.S. was actually capable of doing some of the same things. Uh, anything that we can do to increase domestic supply is, would be important. So I certainly think that uh, folks would be open to looking at those opportunities. What, uh, as a side here, what, what's, what is the situation? When I was governor in the uh, mid part of the first decade, we were, the, the, we were actually had no supply in, in the United States. We were totally reliant on Canada or uh, from uh, Europe, as I recall. Mm -hmm. we, we did some work at INL to get up and running in that regard. And it was, it was really critical, particularly with the short half-lives of, uh, of some of the isotopes. What's the situation now? Uh, well, uh, you're probably referring mostly to molybdenum. Um, and um, we are still reliant. 90% uh, of uh, the molybdenum um, uh, uh, sourced into the U.S. is still uh, foreign sourced, uh, either from Europe, uh, South Africa, or Australia. Um, we do have one uh, domestic supplier, uh, North Star uh, in Wisconsin. Um, there uh, are others that are uh, looking at uh, uh, becoming uh, domestic uh, producers. Uh, Shine in uh, Wisconsin also is another uh, commercial organization that is, that is getting close. Uh, but we're still working on uh, increasing domestic supply of molybdenum and certainly many of the other isotopes that are needed um, by uh, healthcare professionals. I appreciate that. It's so important in the, in the medical field. Well, uh, with that, I'll, I'll close. I, I just want to say that I, I appreciate uh, the chairman, the ranking member, doing this. I, I think the the economics of this is so important, and uh, and the fact that uh, we do look at these uh, alternative things. Senator, Senator, the chairman, Senator Manchin, and I uh, 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 drew and got passed the Integrated Energy Systems Bill, which was signed into law last year, which which is accelerating uh, uh, this research at the DOE, which uh, we appreciate uh, all your work in it, and and it's so important and. In helping to keep online those these 93 reactors that we have left, I, I expect that that's going to turn around, but uh, it's going to take some time. There's no question about it. With that, I'll yield back. But thank you very thank much, you. Senator Hoven. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Dr. Uh, Bragg. Sitting, um, you know, I know we're talking about nuclear here, but also uh, I want to ask you: uh, in addition to nuclear, do you agree that we need to accelerate de uh, deployment? of carbon capture technologies allowing us to continue to benefit from our abundant, low-cost, dependable fossil energy resources. Uh, and that's something, obviously, that the ranking member and I have a lot of in our states is a lot of coal-fired electricity. And do you think with carbon capture that we, uh, we can and should make those investments to continue that base load generation? So carbon capture is a little outside of my main technical area, but I will say that to get to these ambitious goals we have to achieve that net zero economy, it's going to take everything we have in our toolbox. There, we will need renewables, we will need nuclear, we will need fossil with carbon capture. And how we accomplish that carbon capture does require some additional research. We also are looking to direct air capture to capture CO2 that's already emitted in our environment. And I think those technologies will play a significant role in the solution. And those nuclear plants could be sited right alongside those fossil plants and other plants that emit CO2 to help drive that capture technology to reduce costs. Oh, that's a very interesting idea. Um, what are some other ways to improve the commercial viability for advanced reactors and bring technology to scale? I think we need to build it. <laughs> I think that... Uh, Bringing those technologies to the commercial sector requires commitment. It requires us to develop and, and demonstrate those technologies and get to the finish line by deploying those technologies at scale such that we can bring costs down such, and make them cost competitive. And producing these multiple product streams will be a part of that cost competitiveness. When we look to build out of additional resources, we often look to just the electric sector. And we make decisions based on the cost of that electricity. But bringing back that conversation on leveling the playing field, part of that is looking at all the assets these technologies bring to the forefront. Uh, renewables will play a role. 
but most of those renewables provide only electricity, and that's only part of our energy use. These advanced reactors offer those additional opportunities for heat and electricity that can support such a wide array of industrial, application, industrial applications, chemical manufacturing, bring back some of the domestic steel manufacturing. We need to value those product streams and bring that into the decision process when new plants are built. And Thank Senator Oven, specifically to your, to your question around what can we do to make these technologies more, more cost effective and more competitive, so the challenge is that they are first-of-a-kind technologies, and as a result, they tend to be more expensive. And that, that's, that's my colleague's argument on why we need to build them, right? Because if we build them, then they're no longer first-of-a-kind, because we get those lessons learned, and we get to save and, and learn on the nth uh, cost savings. But stepping off, starting off as a utility, we, we try to be very much technology agnostic. Whatever's in the best interest of our customers in terms of cost and reliability, that's what we're going to go with. And if you want to level the playing field with renewables, then an investment tax credit, not unlike what renewables have, particularly in the solar, solar field, and if you can normalize, get rid of the requirement to normalize those costs, those are benefits that pass directly to our customers. So if I can take that tax credit and pass that benefit directly to my customer and it reduces that cost for my customer, that greatly incentivizes that technology and enables me to bring that technology to my customers. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Chodak. Uh, and then, uh, Mr. Gostello, given our reliance on foreign sources for isotopes, particularly from Russia, uh, what, should we, what steps should the U.S. take to increase our domestic production capabilities? Well, we, we are taking steps currently uh, to inc uh, increase uh, domestic supply. Um, th uh, there are uh, several core member companies, uh, two of which I've already mentioned, that with uh, help from uh, the Department of Energy and uh, uh, the uh, grants of uh, uh, cooperative agreements uh, are either currently producing uh, or are close to uh, uh, producing. Uh, some of the primary uh, radioisotopes that are used uh, in, in nuclear medicine, uh, molybdenum, xenon, I-131, iodine-131, uh, uh, used for uh, uh, thyroid disease. Uh, in addition, um, there are uh, efforts right now um, to uh, install uh, a fleet of uh, uh, particle accelerators um, to produce uh, some of the radiotherapies, um, like uh, actinium, for example, directly, or by uh, 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 using uh, stable isotopes and irradiating those uh, either in cyclotrons or particle accelerators. And uh, we have, uh, uh, there are some core member companies that are working towards that and also. So efforts are being made. Um, also, uh, as I had mentioned earlier uh, in my testimony, um, the uh, efforts with the Department of Energy um, uh, isotope program uh, have been extremely helpful, uh, and uh, the collaboration between industry and the DOE is uh, necessary right now to continue to provide much-needed isotopes that may not be commercially uh, viable at this point, uh, but certainly needed by researchers, researchers and uh, uh, physicians uh, in looking at uh, new treatments and new diagnostics. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ranking Member. Uh, Senator Risch, any additional thoughts or questions? Yes. I, uh, you, you piqued my interest in a question. You know, some time ago, um, <clears throat> There was a lot of excitement about hydrogen. You know, that was going to be the new, going to save the world uh, kind of uh, idea, new shiny object. Um, and that, that's really, it didn't mature very much, it doesn't seem like, and not, not moving. Can, can you uh, give us your thoughts on that where, that, where that is, where it's going, whether it's got the, the potential everybody thought it had at the beginning? Thank you very much. Hydrogen is a very significant focus right now. And why is it such a focus? It's because hydrogen is a highly versatile energy carrier. And we can produce it without emissions when we use non-emitting uh, heat and electricity from nuclear energy. And this hydrogen can be stored so that it can be used now or it can be used later or even transported to end users. So it's Essentially, a chemical energy storage means, and by producing that hydrogen, it gives us these additional revenue streams for our operating plants. <clears throat> is there an uh, industry developing around that? Yes, yeah, so hydrogen is, is an avenue to decarbonization of the electricity grid, transportation, and industry. 
My colleagues at the Renewable Energy Laboratory and Argonne National Laboratory have looked at market growth for that hydrogen, and those estimates range from growth uh, on the order of four to 16 times, depending on different assumptions being made. That hydrogen can be used to produce electricity with reversible fuel cells or via combustion in gas turbines. Without emissions, we can use that in transportation uh, for fuel cell vehicles or through the production of synthetic liquid fuels to begin meeting the needs for heavy duty transport or maritime or aviation transport that won't be electrified or are very difficult to electrify. And in regard to industrial applications, there are significant growth opportunities. Now, I mentioned in my early remarks, hydrogen is available today, and we see that mostly through breaking down methane, which has those CO2 emissions associated. But if we use clean hydrogen, we can use that in upgrading iron ore to create steel, so a domestic manufacturing opportunity for steel without the associated emissions that are traditionally a part of that process. Uh, we can use it to upgrade coal and biomass to produce alternative fuels and chemicals. And as we start valuing this clean energy resource and these clean avenues to achieving these consumer products, we do anticipate a significant growth in those hydrogen markets and a significant opportunity for clean hydrogen. And we're already seeing that demand for clean hydrogen from non-emitting sources growing significantly in places like Europe where a, a premium is being paid for that. And as we develop these technologies further, we will be able to reduce those costs and achieve this energy earthshot goal and the hydrogen earthshot goal of reducing the cost of clean hydrogen dramatically over the next uh, decade, which will again grow that market considerably. Interesting. Senator, I was at a, a conference just yesterday, um, the Association of Edison Illuminating Companies, where I listen to executives from Mitsubishi Heavy Industries who have a project where they're working to develop green hydrogen. And if you look at the major turbine manufacturers, they're developing turbines to be able to run on hydrogen. In the transportation industry, you also have oil companies looking at potentially transitioning from using hydrocarbons to, using, to generating hydrogen for transportation industry. So the answer is not if hydrogen is going to be part of the future. It's just a matter of when and at what cost. Uh, the real challenge is around, particularly for electricity use and energy storage, you know, we make a product and the, the electricity that's turning these lights on right now came off a generator less than a second ago. And it's not easy to store it for more than four to six hours. That's, that's the limit of existing technology. Hydrogen is that technology that allows us to store it so that, for example, in, in areas where you don't have the sun shining all year long, but you have a really strong summer, I can take some of that solar energy, put it into hydrogen, and then take that hydrogen and use it later back during off-season periods where I don't have as much solar power. Um, and there are all kinds of uh, opportunities with small modular reactors to create that hydrogen that gets used in that infrastructure both for transportation and also potentially for electricity generation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Russell. Well, uh, thanks so much. And I think, as Dr. Uh, Bragg Sitton just said, uh, issues of what we're seeing in Europe now with energy prices even more expensive than they are here, more issues of en energy poverty mm -hmm. that are going there that uh, we need to continue to develop our opportunities here in the United States. So thanks. Thank you for that. Um, thank you all for being here today. The, uh, we're very grateful for your testimony. I think it was a very important hearing. Members are going to have until the close of business tomorrow to submit additional questions. Uh, for the record, we'd ask you to be uh, thoughtful as well as expedient in uh, re re replying to those. With that, uh, the committee stands adjourned. Thank you.